Well, today we're in chapter 11 here in uh, the book of Joshua. We'll look at, as I said, at both uh, chapters 11 and 12. But here in uh, verse 1, Joshua chapter 11, we'll read to verse 5. We'll see how this chapter deals with what we would call a continuing conquest. And so beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5, Joshua chapter 11, we read, And it came to pass, when Yavin king of Hazor heard these things, that he sent to Joab, Jobab. Actually, I shouldn't do the, the, the way they pronounce this in Hebrew is different than how we say it in English. So I'm just going to read it in English because I don't read Hebrew. But uh, I know how some of these names are pronounced or sound like, but I'll just read it as, it's, as it sounds. And I'll begin again. It came to pass when Charlie, king of Hazor, <laughs> when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard these things that he sent to Jobab, king of Maiden, uh, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Ashaph, <clears throat> the kings who were from the north, the mountains and the plains south of Kinneroth in the lowland, and in the heights of Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and in the west, the Amorite, the Hittite, Perizzite, Jebusite in the mountains, the Hivite, below Hermon in the land of Mizpah, so they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many people, as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude, with very many horses and chariots. And all these kings had met together. They came and camped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. Now Joshua, as we're looking at the book of Joshua, we need to remember that Joshua had a strategy. Joshua had a plan. He had a plan on how to conquer what has been referred to as the promised land. And the strategy that he had was what we would today simply refer to as the, uh, the strategy of divide and conquer. As we've been looking at the book of Joshua, we see how that they entered in, the, the Jewish troops entered in at first to the center. And so the center part or central uh, Israel was initially conquered we saw how they came against uh, Jericho and how they came against the small city of Ai. After they took Jericho and Ai and that surrounding territory, they began to go south. And as they were proceeding south, they went all the way down south. If you're looking at the map of Israel, they go all the way down south there by the Dead Sea. So they began to take the south. So by taking the center and taking the south, they were dividing those properties or those portions of Israel from the north. And so there was a plan involved. There was a strategy involved in the conquering of the land, and it was divide and conquer. Now, undoubtedly, this plan was something that didn't simply come through experience or human ingenuity. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs 16, verse 1, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So undoubtedly, this was simply a plan that was given to uh, Joshua by the Lord. And so he began his dividing and conquering by entering into central Israel, going to the uh, territory of the south, and now he's ready to conquer the territory that is to the north. Now, we just read of this man. His name is Jabin here in verse 1. It came to pass when, when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard these things. So we're introduced to a king by the name of Jabin. Now, Jabin is identified as a king who rules in a very powerful city called Hazor. Now, Hazor was to the north. When you look at a map, once again, you see the Sea of Galilee to the north, and Hazor was in that general area. It was to the north there by the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it was a, a city that he ruled in that was a very powerful city. Hazor was also a very prestigious city in ancient times. As I was Doing some review on this, I wanted to see if there were any uh, archaeological notations on this particular city that I could share with you. And one source said, concerning the ruins that were discovered on the site of ancient Hazor, that the city also showed signs of having been a magnificent Canaanite city prior to its destruction. It had great temples, opulent palaces that were split into an upper acropolis. It had the lower city and the town had been a major Canaanite city. And so this particular city that was ruled by a man by the name of Jabin, Jabin had had 
ample time to hear the things that had been going on to his south. You see, when you begin to look at the conquest of, uh, of the promised land, because we're just reading chapter by chapter, we don't really get an, an insight or a sense of, of the length of time that would have had to have proceeded from the first entrance into the land to the conquering of the land. Conservative scholars estimate no less than seven years. So from the beginning, when they came in and took Jericho, Ai went south. When they went up to the north, you're looking at a, a period of time that was lengthy. We're looking at around seven years. And so over the years that it had taken for, for them to take Jericho and to take Ai and to go down to the south and establish and, and begin to work and rule and all of that, well, that was plenty of time for this king up in the north by the name of Jabin to hear of, uh, of what was taking place and to be at the ready because in the event that these uh, Jews would be coming up to take his, his land, his city, and, and all, he would have to be prepared. And so he has had time to estimate uh, what's going to take place. It took years. The campaigns took, like I said, up to seven years. Conquest, uh, the news of the conquest has reached his ears. And so his response is to develop a coalition. And so he develops a coalition in order that he might oppose the Jews, and he sends to various kings, even as we read their names. He sent to uh, Jobab, the king of Medan. That is a city that was to the north, outside of the city of Tiberias. If you were to look at a map, and you were to look at the Sea of Galilee, and you were to look on the western shore in the center and go about five miles to the west, that's where this particular city was. Uh, there was another city that's mentioned here, Shimron. It's a, a fortified city. You had an, an, another city called Ashops, which is, uh, the word means, when pronounced correctly, it, it means sorcery, it means fascination. It may have, uh, that may give us some insight into the, uh, the religious faith of the inhabitants of that area. And then you see something here that I find very interesting, and this is something I'll just touch on for you. But notice verse 2, when he speaks about the plain south of Kinneroth. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I am going to rhetorically ask the question, does anybody know Kinneroth? And the answer is, you all do. Even if at the moment you don't recognize it. The word Kinneroth. The word Kinneroth means harp. But it also has a Greek uh, word that is associated with Kinneroth, and it's Gennesaret. Gennesaret is is another way of speaking of the Sea of Galilee. When you read your New Testament, you see the Sea of Galilee. And we all, today in the 21st century, when we speak concerning the, that giant lake that is there in the north of Israel, we always refer to it as the Sea of Galilee. And the reason it's called the Sea of Galilee is because it's a large lake, and therefore they refer to it as the sea. But in the Old Testament, the Sea of Gal Galilee is actually called Kinnereth, or the Sea of Kinnereth. The word harp there is Gennesaret, in the New Testament, the word Gennesaret is, is the word harp in Greek. And the reason it's called harp is simply because it had the shape of a harp. And so this is simply giving to us geographic location. And the key for us, if we didn't know anything else, and we wanted to know where this is taking place, all we need to know is Kinneroth. Because Kinneroth is to the north. That helped me even as I was reading this. And, and I knew that this was going to take place in the north and all. But that was a geographic location that helped me to be able to localize what was taking place. And so all of this is taking place to the north. This is up there by the Sea of Galilee. So what does he do? Again, he, he develops a coalition to oppose the Jews. Now, in verse 3, it says, To the Canaanites in the east, the west, the Amorite, Hittite, Perizzite, Jebusite, Hivite, Bilo Hermon, land of Mitzvah, they went out. They and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude, with very many horses and chariots. And when all these kings had met together, they came and camped together at the waters of Merim to fight against Israel. And so these people form an alliance, and they are going to be opposing what they refer to and would consider invaders. They join their armies in, by what is called the waters of Merim. The waters of Merim, if you were looking at the Sea of Galilee and and you saw a, a tributary that was leading to it. It's like a, a line that's kind of like just a, a, like a small river of some sort. That would be called uh, the waters of Merom. And um, if you've been to Israel, then this will help you. It's uh, located in what is today referred to as the Hula Valley. 
The Hula Valley, we all know, the Hula Valley is where the very first Hawaiian ever danced. It was in the Hula Valley. But anyway, so that's up to the north also and off to the, uh, to the west. Now, I wanted to just make an application for just a moment. It's interesting to me how under certain conditions people can actually unite for a common cause. In this case, they were uniting in opposition, but they were uniting because they wanted to preserve their way of life. They united in what we would call today a common cause, and their common cause was to resist their enemies. And so they unite joining forces to fight against that which they're in opposition to. And these are a group of people, as we're going to see in a moment, I'm going to develop this with you as we go through this study, that were really under the judgment of God. And yet they had a heart to unite in opposition to what God was doing. Now, in their uniting together, it reminds me that, uh, of something that happened later on in their history. Uh, it, it happened during the time of the prophet Samuel. And when you read in uh, 1 Samuel, you see that Israel had gone to fight the Philistines. And, and the first battle that they had ended poorly for Israel. And the Bible tells us in this, in this battle, they lost some 4,000 soldiers. So the Jews were dispirited, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to guarantee success, and so they had amongst them what was called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of the presence of God in the nation of Israel. It was a place where God would actually allow his presence to be in order that he might commune with Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was something that was of great value to the Jews, and so the Jews had lost this battle. They lost 4,000 people. They're greatly upset, and so they make a determination. They're going to continue fighting, but now they're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant with them. So for them, it was really a, a, almost a good luck charm, a symbol of God's presence, but not in a religious or a holy sense. And so when the Ark of the Covenant is brought out amongst the, the children of Israel, a shout goes up. Amongst the people, they begin to shout because the ark is there because they think that this ark is going to guarantee their success against the Philistines. Well, the Philistine army hears the shouting that's taking place. And they have great fear because they say, oh my goodness, their God is now amongst them. And so they're aware of the stories that relate to God's presence with the children of Israel. But the Philistines, these, these pagan people, they were called the sea people, these, these pagan people, instead of running, actually say something that is really amazing. It's found in 1 Samuel 4, verse 9. And this is how they strengthened themselves. This is how they comforted themselves. In 1 Samuel 4, 9, it, it says that they said, Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. That's what the world does. When the world begins to wade through the options and begin to realize that their way of life, the things that they do, the things that they like, the things that they value, are coming under attack. They have a tendency of uniting. And they fight. And guess what? They don't quit. The world doesn't quit. Here's something for you. Some of you are aware of this. Others perhaps are not. Some could care less, and others will be greatly interested. 1947, ancient history. Dodgers had a manager by the name of Leo de Rocher. Anybody here remember the name? Leo de Rocher, well-known well name. It's like, how many of you don't know? Angel fans, Leo de Rocher. <laughs> he was a very well-known Dodger manager. He was not known for being a moral man and was committing adultery. And when he was committing adultery, 
a particular Catholic youth organization called the uh, Commissioner of Baseball. This is 1947. And said that DeRocher is undermining the morals of America's youth because he's an unrepentant adulterer. And you know what happened? The commissioner of baseball called Branch Rickey and told him, who was the general manager for the Dodgers, told him, you need to suspend DeRocher because this youth organization is threatening to boycott baseball games. And if you don't suspend him, we're going to lose business and we're going to lose our 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 model. We're going to lose our, our image. And so when Jackie Robinson was brought into baseball to play in 47, he didn't play under the skipper. He didn't play under DeRocher. He played under an interim manager because there was an uproar by this Catholic youth organization because of the undermining of morals. And America, in 1947, would not have put up with that. Fast forward to 2013. What would happen now? We'd probably say, well, what happened when this African-American basketball player came out and said he's a homosexual? He becomes a model, the new Jackie Robinson. That's what happened. That happened since 47 to 2013. The world doesn't stop. The world doesn't give up. The world continues moving. The world continues fighting. The world wants its way. The church goes to sleep. The church gives up, but the world doesn't. The church loses its traction, but the world doesn't. The world keeps pushing its anti-God agenda and will not cease. So we're in a battle, aren't we? We are in a war. And thank God you're here tonight because to me it matters. Because a midweek study ought to matter. We ought to get in the word of God. We ought to be in prayer. We ought to be in fellowship. We ought to be aware of the times we're living in. You see, the Philistines did not want to yield and become servants to the Hebrews. So they say, fight like men. Be men. And that's a word that really should go out to all the believers in Jesus Christ in these last days, don't you think? Fight like people who, who know what's going on. Fight like you understand the cost, you see. And so the world doesn't stop. The world unites, forms coalitions, opposes that which God is doing and will fight to the very end. Believers ought to have the kind of mindset to realize that we are in a spiritual battle ourselves. And, and uh, we have to be equipped for works of service. We have to be ready and we have to be armed. And we are dangerous when we are armed and when we're walking in the spirit. We're dangerous to the kingdom of the enemy. And so these kings meet together and they are going to fight, it says in verse 5, against Israel. Verse 6, but the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Merom. They attacked them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon, to the brook Misrepoth, and to the valley of Mizpah, eastward, they attacked them until they left none of them remaining. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Now, these kings were powerful. These kings were united. They were in opposition. You see, in previous battles, the enemy was not quite as prepared and don't seem to be as determined to oppose him. So Joshua needs, needs encouragement from the Lord. Now, the soldiers also need encouragement 
even though they'd already seen God's hand as he delivered them before, yet God needs to encourage them, and he's going to do so. He's going to encourage this, this, this military force through Joshua. Now, their forces may have been smaller than this coalition. Uh, I want you to notice that it speaks concerning the fact that, that there, were, uh, there was a great multitude, there was a great amount of, of uh, enemies against them. And so when we looked in Joshua 4.13, uh, the number 40,000 uh, was there uh, telling us that there, at least in that passage, were around 40,000 Israeli soldiers. And so they may have had a smaller fighting force than the coalition. So they had experience. They, they'd already gone through battles and they were battle hardened, that's true, but they needed to trust in their God. Now in, in our spiritual lives, battles are part of our walk. They're, they're part of the life that we live. Uh, we get saved and, and, and every believer in this room knows this beyond a shadow of a doubt. When you got saved, life didn't get easier, did it? Or it, maybe it did for you, it didn't for me. It didn't get easier. Life became a little tougher because I had made a choice to, to now be living in opposition to the current of the world, you see. And so when I got saved, I, I no longer could yield to the impulses of my, my flesh that were, at one time were just the natural thing to do. I now had to learn to, uh, to recognize myself, to see myself, to reckon myself to be dead in Christ and yet alive. I had to begin to understand that the old impulses were still going to attempt to drive me to behaviors, but... I needed to recognize myself as being um, crucified with Christ and yet alive in Jesus. I needed to see myself as, as more than a conqueror. I needed to understand that God would be with me, never leave me, never forsake me. I needed to understand that I was going to go through life and there was going to be hardship, and that's part of the Christian life. In this world you shall have tribulation, Jesus said. Be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. There will be opposition. There will be pressure and all of that. I needed to understand that. I had to be aware of that. And I needed to know that, that though I was going through these things, that they were going to be normal and they're going to be actually natural. And in the case of Israel, God had already guaranteed them victory, but Israel still needed to fight. All the way back in chapter 1, in verses 5 and 6, it, it, it has said there, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And then he goes on to say, Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So God had said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to give you victory. Hold fast, but you're going to go through tough times. And guess what? Every one of us in this room understand to some degree what that means. Because all of us go through battles and all of us go through opposition ourselves. And so they're going to learn what victory is. And they're going to learn that they're going to have victory in the Lord. And so in verse 7, Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Merim, and they attacked them. And so he uses a tactic here of concentrating overwhelming force at high speed. So this kept them off balance. And it made it almost impossible for, this, for, the, uh, for them to respond effectively against him. And so he came upon them. And he did exactly as the Lord had said he would do. And he hamstrung, according to verse 9, their horses, and he burned their chariots with fire. Now, now today, when we, when we think of uh, horses and chariots, we think, well, that's kind of like, uh, well, that's, that, that doesn't sound very frightening to me. And that's only because we're in a mechanized age. But, you know, right outside here, if you go outside by the fences over there, we, there's some horses over there. And some of you were raised around horses and all I... I never really was, other than that one they used to drop a nickel in and you could ride on in front of the supermarket. That's pretty much the only horse I ever was on, other than the ponies they used to bring through the neighborhood and put us in uh, little cowboy hats and chaps and, and guns and get your pictures taken. But I, I never was a cowboy, though I do love cowboy music. And um, so I don't have a concept, and I, I suppose the majority of us don't really have a concept of what this is really speaking about when it speaks of chariots and it speaks of horses. But you need to just remember one thing, that the chariot was the, what we would call a tank during the times of Joshua. These, these chariots were battle chariots, and the horses were battle horses. And those horses drawing those heavy chariots that were armed and had uh, on, the, on the wheels, they would have razors that would just mow you down, and they'd run over you with them. These were tanks. 
And when you would see all these chariots coming towards you, fear would immediately enter into you because it would be like you standing outside with a slingshot against a tank. There was nothing you could do. And yet God had said, don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. And even though they look like they can conquer you, you are going to end up hamstringing those horses. Those horses will not be able to run and do battle against you. You're going to take care of those chariots. So that was almost an impossible thing to believe. But that's exactly what God does. God will give to you victory so many times, and it looks like there's nothing there except defeat. Well, in verse 10, Joshua turned back at that time and, and took Hazor and struck its king with the sword, for Hazor was formerly the head of all those kingdoms. And they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was none left breathing. Then he burned Hazor with fire. So all the cities of those kings and all the kings Joshua took, struck with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. But as for the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them except Hazor only, which Joshua burned. And all the spoil of these cities and the livestock, the children of Israel took as booty for themselves. But they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. They left none breathing. As the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Well, Hazor, once again, I mentioned Hazor to you as we began. Hazor was the principal city. So in striking Hazor, he cuts off the head, thus killing the body. He kills all the inhabitants, and in doing so, he's guaranteeing that none would arise to seek retaliation in the future. Now, again, verse 11 says he burned Hazor with fire. Now, interestingly enough, this has been verified through archaeological finds in the area. Uh, one source says uh, one archaeological stratum dating from around 1200 B.C., which is the time of Joshua, shows signs of catastrophic fire. And cuneiform tablets found at the site refer to monarchs na named Ibni Adi, where Ibni may be the origin of Jabin. And so there's archaeological proof that this actually took place, and they have found in the ruins the burned uh, remnants of a once mighty city. Now, in verses 12 through 14, it, it says, All the cities of those kings and all the kings Joshua took and struck with the edge of the sword. So after defeating their enemies... Israel now is going to take the spoils of war. The way they did at Ai. In Joshua 8, 2, it said, You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. And so they were able to take and pillage the cities. Now, verse 15, I want to spend a moment looking at that with you. Because verse 15 says, As the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Joshua. Joshua was a great soldier. When you look at the qualities of Joshua, you see that he had tremendous qualities. This was a man who was a man of character, a man of integrity. He was spiritual. He was decisive. He was courageous. He was inspirational. He was resolute. All of those qualities that he has reveals him to be a great leader, one who is worthy to follow and one that you can trust. You can trust a spiritual individual, a man who fears God, you can trust a man who's decisive, somebody who's not vacillating constantly, doesn't know exactly what to say, always kind of looking for a way to not have to deal with something, always putting things under investigation until he can come up with a conclusion. He was decisive. He was courageous. This was a man that, that didn't flinch in the sight of war. He wasn't afraid to battle. He was inspirational. He was the kind of man that would cause those around him who were valiant soldiers uh, to, to take heart and to want to go and to want to fight. And he was resolute. 
he made a decision and he held fast to it. And that's, uh, that's the kind of leader that you want to follow. And that's the kind of leader that you'll trust. But what was the key to his greatness? All of those things that I mentioned, and I could have mentioned many more. We've been looking at Joshua. We've seen these things in him already. What was the key? What is the key to his greatness? And, and this is something that is so simple that, that the average person misses it. This is the thing that the average person doesn't see, especially those who are leaders. They don't see this. It's interesting, but it's true. The key to his success, if you will, the key to his greatness was obedience. Obedience. I want you to see that. Verse 15 once again. Look what it says. The Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. What God had told Moses, and Moses had given to Joshua, Joshua obeyed. His obedience to God and his faithfulness to what had been handed to him revealed a quality in him that was the key to his greatness. It revealed his faith. It revealed the source of his character, the source of his integrity. It revealed that he was a man under orders and that he was faithful to that which was delivered to him. And that is a man you can trust. Paul, when he was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, said, the things that I've given to you, I want you to deliver to faithful men who are able to teach, who can deliver them to other faithful men, so on and so on and so on through the history of the church. Because the church was intended by God to be led by men who were faithfully obedient to God's word. That's what the church is intended to be, led by men who are obedient to God who take what God has given to them and do it. Joshua did what he had been commanded. And Joshua left nothing undone. Joshua was a man who was obedient to the Lord. Oswald Chambers said, the golden rule for understanding in spiritual matters is not intellect, but obedience. If, if you want to understand the things of the Lord, the deeper things of God, though it is a great thing if, if the Lord should lead you to go to school, I'm very supportive of those who have a heart to, to gain an education, to be used by the Lord in a variety of ways through the degrees that they earn. That's a wonderful thing. I was speaking to some guys just yesterday, uh, several pastors that I meet with on a monthly basis, and I said, you know, Calvary Chapel has had a, had a um, reputation in the past that uh, we were um, anti-intellectualism. And there are those who have actually written books concerning Calvary Chapel philosophy who have stated in print that Calvary chapels are, are filled with a, a fear of higher education. That's not true whatsoever. You know, I was telling the guys, I said, you know, when I go to the doctor, I'm, I'm very grateful for the training the doctors had. Uh, I don't want to go to a doctor who says, you know what, I've, I've watched a lot of doctor shows and I really feel inclined towards doctoring and I'd like to take out your gallbladder just to see what it's like. I, I, I don't want to go to somebody who has a feeling that he's got a calling to be a doctor. I, I do appreciate one who had a sense of calling to be a doctor who's also trained. And so in ministry, in ministry, there's a sense of calling you have to have, an anointing of the Holy Spirit that you have to have. But it's also a blessing when you have also training and you're able to learn certain things and put certain things into practice and all of that. But all the training that you have is useless if you think that the training in and of itself is what constitutes spiritual maturity. Because knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And when you look at, at, at uh, knowledge in and of itself, knowledge is the great temptation that was first offered to Eve. When Satan said to Eve, when you take of this forbidden fruit, you shall know, even as God knows. You're going to know the difference between good and evil. It was a temptation to knowledge because knowledge is power. And knowledge that isn't under the authority of God is dangerous. And one of the most dangerous people you'll ever encounter is somebody who's highly educated with no morals. Because they can end up like that doctor who's killing those babies. Highly trained, at it for a long time, with no morals, killing children. 
So education in and of itself, without morals and obedience to the higher things, can be a dangerous thing. And so what we want is we want to grow. And the way that we grow is through knowing the Word of God and obeying God's Word. And growing spiritually will always be tied up with simple obedience to the things that we study in God's Word. It's, it's not what we don't understand that's the problem. It, it's what we do understand and refuse to obey that, the, that is the problem. There have been times that I have spoken to people who have had a problem and I've shared with them, listen, this is what the Bible says and this is how that problem can be solved. And I'll give them a scripture and, and, and they'll say, I already know that. I already know that. And that's when I quote out of John 13, how Jesus said, if, if you know these things, blessed are you if you what? If you do them. It, it's not enough for you to say, oh, I already know that. See, there are a lot of people who, who say that they at one time were Christians and um, they're no longer a Christian because it just doesn't work. No, what they've done is they basically claimed to know Christ based on maybe attending church or having a few Bible studies or maybe reading some of the Bible, and then they wanted something desperately that wasn't within the will of God for them in their life. They didn't get it. They were upset, and therefore God isn't real because he didn't give me what I wanted. Obedience. It, 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 it's, it's simple, and yet it's difficult because it requires dying to self. Joshua was obedient. And his obedience gave his leadership credibility. That obedience was also true in the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. There was a, it was so obvious that there was an occasion when a Roman centurion had approached the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of a servant of his who was very ill. And uh, Jesus, when he spoke to, when the centurion spoke to Jesus about his servant who was ill, Jesus had said, I'll come to your house, and, and, and the Roman centurion, centurion responded. It's found in Matthew 8, verses 8 through 10, where it says the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. But he goes on to say, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. This man said, I too am a man under authority. He saw something in Jesus. In John 8, 29, Jesus said, The one who sent me is with me. He hasn't left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Jesus was under authority. Authority of, of his Father. We are under the authority of our God. And, and when we are under the authority of God, that simply means that we are going to be obedient to him. Joshua obeyed God. And that's what made Joshua a powerful leader. And that's what made men and a nation able to follow after him. As the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, in Deuteronomy 7, 1 and 2, it says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, Gergeshites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God delivered them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. And that's exactly what Joshua did. He took care of business. Now in verse 16, so Joshua took all this land, the mountain country, all the south, all the land of Goshen, the lowland, the Jordan plain, the mountains of Israel and its lowlands from Mount Halak to the ascent of Seir, even as far as Baal God, in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings, struck them down, killed them. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. The land of Goshen, we hear of that. If you're looking at a map and you're looking at Egypt, the land of Goshen would be to the top north and all the way to the eastern 
area. That would be called the, um, the land of Goshen. Mount Halak is south of the Dead Sea. Seir is a mountain range in Jordan, south of the Dead Sea also. And Baal God is in the north at the foot of Mount Hermon. So it's just giving you a geographic location of all the places that had been taken. In verse 19, there was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, all the others they took in battle. And we remember that the Gibeonites deceived them into a, a peace treaty. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might utterly destroy them, and that, he might that they might receive no mercy, but that he might destroy them as the Lord had commanded Moses. The people in that area, when you read this, you may be thinking, that sounds kind of harsh. But the people in the area were given over to their various sins. And none, not the least being the sin of idolatry. And as they yielded to these sins, they, be, they were voluntarily hardening themselves against God. And, and their sins had produced a hardness. And this hardness uh, yields to an insensibility to God and an unwillingness to be repentant. And so this hardness to God and an unrepentant heart is enough cause for God to bring judgment. Proverbs 28, 14 says, Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Proverbs 29, 1 says, He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. So hardness had taken place in these people, and so God judgment against them. Romans 2, 4 asks a question, Do you despise the riches of his goodness? forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So we need to understand that, that just because we haven't been judged immediately when we do some sinful act doesn't mean that God is showing approval of it. It simply means that God has given us space to repent. He's given us some time to do so. He's given to us opportunity to think it through, to be convicted in order that we might repent, seek forgiveness and change. But if we harden our, our hearts continually, then the only thing that's going to happen for us would be judgment. He goes on in verse 21 to say, And at that time Joshua came and cut off the Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, Deber, from Anab, from all the mountains of Judah, from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. None of the Anakim were left in the land of the children of Israel. They remained only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said to Moses. And Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to the divisions by their tribes. And then the land rested from war. The Anakim. Who are these Anakim? They're in a movie called Star Wars. Now, who is Anakim? Well, I'll just give you... I just cut and paste this because it said it well. The Anakim are a race of giants descended from Anak. They dwelt in the south of the land of Canaan near Hebron. According to Genesis 14, they inhabited the region afterwards known as Edom and Moab in the days of Abraham. Their formidable appearance, as described by the 12 spies sent to search the land, filled the Israelites with terror. They were giants, is what they were. The Israelites seem to have identified them with the Nephilim, the giants found in Genesis 6 and Numbers 13 that lived before the flood. Joshua finally expelled them from the land, accepting a remnant that found a refuge in the cities of Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Now those three cities, by the way, are Philistine cities. The Philistine giants whom David encountered in 2 Samuel, as, as well as Goliath and First Samuel, were descendants of the Anakim. We all know of Goliath, but Goliath wasn't the only giant. Goliath, as we know through studying Scripture and taking into consideration um, the dimensions, was a man who was uh, nine foot nine inches tall. And I, I've read in the past how people say, that's why I don't believe the Bible is accurate, because it speaks of human beings that, that reached the height of over nine feet. But uh, there was an individual who was the tallest uh, individual alive at his time. He was eight feet, ten inches tall. 
And so even in, in recent time, we've had individuals who are well over eight feet tall. This was a particular race, though, that is being referred to here, the Anakim. And they were a race of giants. They were fearsome and formidable and very frightening to the, to the Jews. And even as stated, even as I was reading this a moment ago, when uh, Joshua and Caleb and the other ten spies went to spy out the land in preparation of taking it, conquering it, uh, we read how that they went out there, went from the top to the, to the bottom, and they were gone for, for quite some time, and they returned, and they even brought some remnants of the fruit of the land to demonstrate how, how lush and how it was producing such wonderful things and all. And, and as they came back, uh, they said, it's great, there's no doubt about it, and the land is absolutely beautiful, and, but there's one problem that we have found with it that, that concerns us greatly, and, and it's the fact that they have giants in the land. And the giants that are being referred to there are the Anakim, the, the, the ones who were, they were over nine feet tall. And, and the way they spoke concerning them was simply this. They said, they are, we are like grasshoppers in their sight, which is one way of saying it, but the thing that I've always found interesting in that passage is when they said also, and we are grasshoppers in our own sight. The Anakim, giants, great opposition. The problem that they were going to encounter was a human problem. They were giants. The giants had this haughty attitude. It's kind of like Goliath had, even as he showed it to David. David looks at him, and, and, and Goliath looks back at David, and what is this? What am I, a dog that you should come and chase me down with sticks? Come over here, he says, so I can, I can kill you, and I'll give your body to the, to the birds of the air. Let's get this done quickly. I, I had a cutout when I was taking you through the battle of David and Goliath, and I had a 9 foot 9 in, inch uh, cutout of a, 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 you know, so it's, it's human size, it looked human, and I... Some of you may have been here. It was a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And I stood next to it, and I came up basically, basically through the belt. I mean, that's how huge Goliath was. And he's looking down at this, this little shepherd boy, and he comes with uh, five smooth stones and a sling, a shepherd's sling. But David's strength was not in his ability to cast a stone in a sling, though he was an expert at it. It wasn't even his courage that he had because the man was an absolute warrior himself who took down the wolf, he could take down the lion, barehanded, basically. He was, he was a soldier, he was a warrior. This is a man who was fierce, and there's no doubt about it. But he was coming against an opponent who was nine foot nine, a battle-hardened opponent, one of the giants. David said, well, you come to me with your weapons of war, but I come to you in the name of God, and I have to tell you, today he's going to give you into my hands, and I'm going to take your head off your body. I'm going to feed your body to the birds of the air, because I come to you in the name of God. And if we could, if we could only understand that, then those things that have become giants in our lives would be overcome, because it's not in your own strength. Listen carefully. It's not in your own strength. You can't do it in your own strength. It's in the strength of the Lord. And your strength doesn't come through you standing up. Your strength comes when you kneel down and you submit yourself to God. And you say, God, help me. I can't do this. That was the key to Joshua's greatness. Yes, he was courageous. And yes, he, he had integrity. And yes, he was valiant in every way that you could be. But there was something about Joshua that we need to learn from today, and that is he was obedient. He trusted God. He did what God said. God blessed him. God will bless us too if we're obedient also. See? Now, finally, chapter 12, it's just a list of the names of the kings that were conquered. So we're not going to go through that. It simply says... In verse 24, all the kings, 31. So what you have in chapter 12 are the kings that were initially in the first few verses, the kings that had been conquered by Moses. And then from verse 7 to the conclusion, continuation, the kings conquered by Joshua. 
And so quite obviously, we don't need to go through these names of all these kings other than there's one interesting verse in verse 6, and then I'll close with this, where it says in chapter 12, verse 6, Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel had conquered. Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given it as a possession to the Reubenites. So that shows us that there were Mexicans in Israel back at that time. The Reubenites. 